it's fascinating, and it's not just me or Ocean Futures or my colleagues, to make sure every human being realizes how connected we are to the ocean and how much we depend upon it, whether you live near it or far away from it. And usually, I would say 90% or maybe more of the people say, oh, I didn't know. Oh, I want to do that. Oh, I want to learn about this. Because it is fascinating. It's like adventure, like discovery, just like when I go up on land and listen to local people who are experts and they can teach me and show me what to do and what not to do and what to take and what not take. And it's the same with the ocean. But we live on 30% of the planet, and we know a lot more about what's going on on the 30% than we know what's going in the ocean. Welcome to Care More, Be Better, a podcast for people like you who care about the social impact of conscious companies and everyday heroes. Hear inspiring stories from those who put people and planet before profit and personal gain. You'll learn how you can make a difference, vote with your dollars, and get involved today. Here's your host, Karina Belizzi. Hello, fellow do-gooders and friends. I'm your host, Karina Belizzi. If you're a lover of the natural world, of our oceans, of getting outdoors, of doing things like scuba diving, then you are in for an incredible treat today. I'm thrilled to introduce to all of you, Jean-Michel Cousteau. He is an explorer, an environmentalist, creator, an educator, a film producer, and just an all-around incredible human. Jean-Michel Cousteau, for more than four decades, has been dedicating himself to sharing all of this experience, his love for the oceans and his concern for our water planet, this space that we all inhabit together with people of every nation of the world. He joins us today so that we can learn more about his work with Ocean Futures Society, which is Santa Barbara based. It's a not-for-profit. It's been going for many years and an incredible upcoming event that he's been invited to participate in. It's called 78 Years of Discovery, of Diving and Discovery, rather. This will be hosted at the Ritz-Carlton, which is in Santa Barbara, November 10th to 12th, 2023. And man, will we all be in for a treat if we can join him there. Jean-Michel Cousteau, welcome to the show. Thank you very much, very, very much, uh, Corina. And I just found out before I had the pleasure of being with you uh, that you are a scuba diver yourself. Bravo. <laughs> yes, the underwater world has always been something that intrigued me from the moment I could get in the water. Now, I don't know if you knew this, but I recently also interviewed Paula DePerna about her work with this book she wrote called Pricing the Priceless. And I understand that she collaborated with your father, Jacques Cousteau, and worked with him for a few years, even helping him write books and things like that. So it was just a moment where I touched on someone who had been an idol that, you know, got me into thinking about the underwater world. So and I learned I'm talking about Ted Turner. I've been on the expedition many times, and he was very much involved, and he was uh, very responsible for us being able to produce all those shows that we were able to put, that he was able to put on the air. And uh, Ted uh, has been an amazing supporter of our, all of our work. And then he focused on other things, which he is still today. But I got invited to celebrate his uh, 85th birthday in November, and I will be there at his, uh, at his place uh, where uh, we're going to be with all the old timers joining him because he's a secret to the planet. Yeah. Well, scuba diving and exploring the underwater world, really, it was like going into outer space. And, you know, Technology has come so far, diving has changed over the years, but our oceans have sadly changed for the worst in many cases. And um, I know that we'll talk a bit about that today. I can see that you have kept your nose to the grindstone and really working to protect our open spaces throughout your entire life. And with 78 years of diving history, what are the most memorable moments that you have to share from your adventures in the sea? And what makes them stand out for you? The most exciting moment yes moments per i'm sure there's more than one there are many and for me the most exciting moment is the next one <laughs> the next time you get I'm to get the water looking forward, always looking forward to my next dive and uh, i always see different behavior or different species 
or different connection between the species which we didn't know before. How can you protect what you don't understand? And I've learned that a lot from my dad, who put a tank on my back when I was seven, and I started diving in those days at the very beginning when there were no certification. Things have changed, and I'm glad it has. And now there are millions of people wanting to dive. But I think that uh, we have a very, very exciting period of time ahead of us, uh, and that's why we'll never stop. And uh, I'm glad you were asking me those questions. Yeah, well, I can think of a few moments in my time diving that have stood out to me, perhaps the first time I saw a shark in the water. <laughs> and, you know, Developed by fear. To be scared about sharks. Yes, everyone, you, you, you grow up thinking that there's something to be feared in many cases. And in my case, I was diving on Kauai or off the island, so to speak. And um, the open ocean was just a vast array of blue. I had learned to dive in the Monterey Bay, which, you know, you, you have a ton of things to show you scale. But when you're in the great open blue water and you look out a reef shark approaching you, with such incredible visibility and depth of vision, being able to see 300 feet or something to that effect, there's no scale by which to identify them. So I was sure one of these sharks was at least 15 feet and he comes up to me and they're like this long. <laughs> so relaxed, breathed and learn not to fear sharks with each subsequent dive. So I think that's one thing I would love to counsel people to do. If you are getting into the ocean, just open your mind and, and try not to fear. Well, you have to learn about what each species is attracted by or why and, and so on. Sharks are very sensitive to smell and vision. And if the water is not clear and a shark comes, they make mistakes. They don't like to eat us. We're not good food, but they make mistakes. And I've learned that a long time ago, and I've been able to dive with many different species of sharks, and I will never stop unless the water is not clear or there is somebody hurt that is bleeding, uh, and then I just back away. But uh, otherwise, I have absolutely no problem based with sharks. And I was in South Africa where a gentleman who was a fisherman who learned about the presence of sharks, and he said, you know, if the water is clear and there is no blood there, you can go and they'll come, they look at you and they go away. And he said, if you want to, because the conditions are perfect, you can grab the dorsal fin and they will take you for a ride. And I've done that with one 11 foot great white shark. And uh, I went underwater and at some point I had to let it go because I needed to breathe and the shark kept going away. So we need to learn and how can we do what needs to be done to protect what every one of us, you and I depend upon by not uh, spending all the time we need to do in the ocean. Absolutely right. I mean, I'm here on the central coast of California, and there are people in the ocean constantly surfing, right? They're all Sur Surf City, USA, Santa Cruz. You know, they spend their time on top of the water. I drive out to Monterey, and I spend my time below water. In neither case do you hear about shark attacks coming like crazy. So I want for people to develop that healthy respect for the ocean, but also just get to know more about it. Now, as far as your time in the end, what you've seen around the globe, I wonder how you've seen our underwater world change over the course of the last few decades. What have you noticed? Well, a lot is changing because uh, there are several issues. Number one, we polluting what we all depend upon, which is the ocean. And uh, we're talking about all the plastic but we never talk about all the chemicals and heavy metals. And when you take a tablet of aspirin, uh, it hopefully it takes care of your headache. But uh, what happened to that chemical? It goes right into the ocean. So there are places where there's too much of that going on. And it affects, for example, uh, turtles, uh, which are born on the beach. And uh, they are... Uh, little baby whites coming out of the sand and they have all tumors and so on and the objective is to go back in the ocean well all those chemicals are, have affected them while they were born because they are born from a, an egg that the turtle is putting under the sand 
So we need to learn all of this and uh, we can share a lot of that with people and then they understand and they want to change their behavior and their actions. And we are heading that way. We have uh, another 100 million people invading the planet every year. So we need to communicate with them because we all depend upon the ocean. And we, like you and I, uh, we live near the, the ocean. But what are the people who've never seen the ocean that live up in the mountains? And uh, they even, some of them go to school there and they grow plants and animals uh, to feed themselves or feed uh, uh, the people who are dependent upon. Well, when you look at the snow on top of a mountain, and you have kids grabbing in the sun and throwing it at each other. And I tell them, and I have a film on that, where I said, hey, you throwing the ocean at each other. Oh, wow. And then they say, what's happening? So I show them. It melts. It creates little streams and a river. And that river becomes big, and it goes all the way. And uh, in the case of uh, the United States, all the way across the United States, and uh, it goes down, down, down. And you have many, many industries cleaning themselves inside these beautiful waters, and they end up in the ocean. So we need to realize that there is one water system. We all depend upon it. And uh, we are made of um, up to maybe 60% of the ocean. So we need to know all of this. And then people make less mistakes. But education is critical, and we never, never uh, want to criticize or point a finger. Uh, we need to reach hearts. People have families, they have children, and they care, and we want them to know about it. And it's exciting and fascinating, and they make discoveries. Because every time you lose a species because we over-harvesting, whether it's on land or in the ocean, whether it's a, a tree or a, an animal of, of any kind, uh, we need to protect every species on land and in the ocean. And every species is the capital. And we can only offer the interest produced by the capital. And that's OK. But if you take more, you start to eat up the capital, and then it goes bankrupt. And that creature or plant uh, is no longer connected to other creatures and plants which depend upon them. So the system becomes a little weaker, and that's why we are living today a very uh, difficult time, but we're getting more and more aware. And I'm happy to say that in the last 20 years or less, uh, you have 8 billion people on the planet who got connected to each other, like you and I are right now. Uh, visually, or telephone, or computers, and on and on, and we never will stop. And I think that's why I will never stop diving, because I want to see behavior I haven't seen, new species that needs to be protected, and to make sure that the people do the right thing. And there are more and more and more people wanting to do that. So we're living a very, very exciting time. Well, I 100% agree with you. And we've covered that story in a, a variety of ways over the course of the last few months. I can think of one in which we interviewed Stephen Hawley about the dams that are being dismantled, or there's advocacy to dismantle dams in the Pacific Northwest so that salmon can make their way back upstreams, so that the orca can be healthy. And then you have somebody like John Rulak, who um, has really started uh, talking around regenerative agriculture, focusing on keeping our rivers blue, which means controlling runoff from farming so that we don't have these out of control algae blooms and also murky rivers with less healthy ecosystems at the same time. Because to your point, all of these, all of these waters are connected and it's just a matter of time before they reach the ocean. And then the ocean provides so much of an incredible resource for diversity of species. At the same time, we're seeing a lot of extinction occur over the course of the last few decades. So I wonder what positive, you know, perhaps silver lining pieces you might have at your fingertips as I think about perhaps some of the scarier <laughs> moments I've encountered in climate science and as it relates to the health of our oceans. 
Well, there's a lot of efforts that are coming, thanks from uh, scientists and people who are curious, interested, and want to share information uh, more today than ever uh, I've experienced in a long, long time. And I'm happy to say that uh, we're heading in the right direction, and I'm very happy to say that. Uh, but the work is huge, and we need to do a lot more than we're doing, but we're uh, going in that direction. And we have to understand, which I didn't know maybe 10 or 15 years ago, uh, the importance of uh, the whales and dolphins, which are marine mammals, warm-blooded like you and I, and uh, they uh, live all over the planet. Uh, some species, like uh, the largest of the uh, uh, dolphins, which are the orcas, they live uh, everywhere on the 60% of the planet or 70% of the planet, which is the ocean. We live on 30%. And people need to know that. And these animals are very important because what they do to release themselves after they've eaten, uh, that contributes to helping many other species, particularly the ones that are deep at 3,000 feet or whatever, uh, to find the food that they need to grow up and so on. And that all of that happens and it releases the air we breathe, you and I, maybe 30, 40 percent uh, on an ongoing basis. So every creatures like marine mammals, which whales, dolphins, sea lions and so on, they are like you and I. We need to protect them. <laughs> And it's very, very important uh, for the future of ourselves because those emissions of air, which we take advantage of it, they are things that uh, we, uh, we need to make sure everybody protects it for the future of our species because we're the only species that has the privilege to decide not to disappear. It's our choice. And uh, whales and dolphins and sea lions they don't have that choice, but they were blood like you and I. So we need, uh, and they have very sophisticated communication systems. And that's why we're very much involved right now uh, in trying to find a way to start a new television series, uh, which I, I really would like to do. And I think we will, but uh, time is of the essence. And it's not for me, but it's for us on the planet to learn everything. And uh, I've had the privilege of diving in many, many parts of the planet, uh, thanks to my dad, his team, and our colleagues, and scientists, and so on, and my children, and Nan, who we met earlier. We all want to do what needs to be done in order to protect the future of our species. And I'm totally convinced that we can do it. But time is of the uh, essence, and we need to do it now. And, uh, but never criticize, blame rich people, whether you're in politics or in uh, industries. Uh, these people have obligations, or they think they have obligations, uh, to be reelected or to make money right now. But at what price? What are the consequences if you don't do what you need to do? Well, they all have families, and uh, you wish to sit down with the president or with the director of an industry and try to communicate, and that's what I've done all my life. And uh, I would say that 80% of the time it works, and that's why we'll never stop. Well, that's the emotional appeal, too, because you're able to pull at their heartstrings. Who can deny the beauty of nature when you go out on a boat like like the one you'll be inviting people out onto in Santa Barbara if they're so lucky to be able to attend that gala and exploration of the coast there? So I was wondering if you could talk for a moment about the future of ocean exploration and the role of technology how do you see this playing into the evolution of ocean exploration? Well, we need, we need to understand how to better explore and not create more uh, pollution. And uh, the air can be very helpful. And that's what we've done when uh, I was out there with uh, 
uh, a new boat that was created uh, with our team and we were going and I'm happy to tell you that one day, because the, the uh, conditions were perfect, we were going 13 knots a minute, 13 knots with no oil. And it was all air pushing us. And uh, so there are new technologies today that are getting better and better and better. And we need to also make sure that we stop uh, going where all these creatures, which we are learning a lot more, particularly along coastlines, depending upon their presence there. And if we go through, you're killing them, you're scaring them. you uh, And that's something we're learning more and more and more. And people and decision makers uh, can make much, much better decisions. So a lot of good news is happening, but it's not enough. And that's why we are uh, helping for the protection of coastlines, creating environment uh, where uh, people cannot do what they normally do, will not go fishing or taking advantage or allow allowing a lot of the pollution to go into the ocean or taking the oil in the wrong place uh, and so on. So we're learning all of this and I think we're making progress and it's very critical. And I'm happy to say that there are some places that are being created which allow some species of uh, whales, uh, like the humpback whales, to uh, come back. And uh, we were almost heading toward losing them, which would affect us. And uh, now we're finding out that perhaps in the near future, it's going to get better and better. So boats, uh, which have to go from one part of the world to the other, they, they, will already, they already have to slow down, go to a different locations, uh, speed much less, use the wind as much as possible. And I think we're heading in that direction one way or the other. The new technologies and uh, working with some friends who maybe uh, can take advantage of the currents because water, unless air is compressible, Water is not compressible, so maybe we can take advantage of that uh, in the rivers, in the streams, in uh, the ocean, I don't know. But uh, there are all kinds of new ideas that are coming in the minds of people and saying, oh, I want to look into this, I want to explore. And there are a lot of people who can help us. And I meet a lot of scientists, biologists uh, who educate me so I can share that knowledge or that information with the public, whether it is with the privilege of being with you today or making a film uh, or making a presentation or putting a educational program called Ambassador of the Environment, uh, which with my colleagues, marine biologists, we've created uh, to put into different places like the Ritz Carlton and six, six different uh, Ritz Carlton on the planet, plus uh, in Fiji, at a place which bears my name, and uh, in uh, Catalina Island, where we have a family program in uh, July every year, and uh, or August, I'm sorry, in August every year. And I've been going there now for 26 years nonstop every year. And uh, we also have kelp, which happens every day, uh, I'm sorry, every year uh, on Catalina, and that is helping people uh, also. So we need to provide as much information as possible to people about what we connected to, depend upon, and a lot of it is fascinating. And that's why I'm always, when people and like you've asked me, what's your best dive? I always say the next one because I'm going to maybe see a new species, a new behavior, uh, or the connection between different species, which I didn't know before, and whether these plants or animals are important. And of course, uh, because of what we're doing to the planet today, there are places where we used to have a huge diversity of coral reefs, and those corals are dying because they are in shallow waters, and they are affected by whatever reach the shallow water of the coastline. So uh, some of those species are moving somewhere else, fortunately, because of the water temperatures changing and 
on and on, but we need to do everything we can to protect and make sure we do what needs to be done. And I think we are heading that way. And uh, I've created a program which is called the GAN Global Ocean Network, uh, which uh, would allow to have position vessels and platforms in uh, eight different, nine different countries, uh, part of the ocean, and being able to communicate from underwater via satellite to anyone, you and I, on my cell phone or whatever, and ask questions if I need to ask questions uh, to somebody who may be at uh, a thousand feet of depth or on a boat or with uh, scuba diving, whatever. There are many ways we're heading in that direction. And that's why I'm still very confident uh, we're going to head in the right direction. It's our choice. And uh, I think communication is very critical to make sure other people do the right thing to protect their family, their children, their grandchildren. And that's what I'm trying to do myself. Well, you mentioned some of what I would call my old diving haunts as you talk about Catalina and probably the Channel Islands there because I've done live aboard boat dives heading out on a couple of different vessels and got to see some of the most extraordinary dive sites from San Miguel Island, where the currents can be quite something to contend with, um, to even diving an oil derrick off the coast of Santa Barbara. We got permission and dove the Eureka oil derrick and got to see how even something like an oil derrick can create an underwater reef with you know, full of nitridium and brittle stars and sheep's head fish and, and all sorts of things. So even artificial reefs, I mean, you can restore reefs with artificial means as well. Not to say that I'm a proponent of diving, in, I mean, of drilling into our seabeds, but these are also things that continue to come onto the docket, even as we're starting to look for rare earth minerals. So I wonder if you have a comment about the exploration of our seas for some of these rare earth minerals. I know there are concerns even about the noise that it will create and how that affects sea life like whales and dolphins. Well, we need to be aware of that and to ask the people who are in charge or would like to uh, explore places uh, to behave in a different way in order to not just protect that environment and these species, but for us to discover things we don't know. And uh, by trying to uh, continue making all the noise that we make and the speed that we do and the propellers that kills everything, there are ways now which is changing. And I was asking about you know, uh, the, the, uh, the uh, current produced by the current and the water I said, well, can we do that? And people say, no, 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 you can't do that because it's going to, uh, if there's a propeller, it's going to kill a fish or maybe a dolphin or whatever. And then the people who were working on it, scientists uh, and so on, I studied with them and they said, you know, for the same amount of energy you get from the, get from the wind on land or above water, Underwater, it's three rotations per minute from a propeller to capture the same energy that the, the ones on top are going very fast. So there are new approach that uh, needs to be uh, explored further to decide what are we going to do next. And uh, the gentleman I was working with showed me that these propellers are going so slowly that the fish are going through and even a dolphin went right through it, couldn't care less because they don't even notice how slow it's moving. And uh, so there's a huge opportunities in the future. And we're going to discover new ways of uh, doing what we need to do to protect ourselves by protecting what we are connected to and depend upon.
I lost you. I had you. to unmute myself. <laughs> no, okay. Ah. So now I, I have um, <laughs> dogs here that were barking a little out of control, so I've been muting myself. I love dogs. I love dogs too, but I wish they would I grew up be quiet dogs. when I'm trying to record on the podcast. <laughs> <laughs> well, you have to tell them, can you be quiet? Whoa, whoa, whoa. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. Suddenly there's a coyote in the open space preserve behind my house. and all. I grew up with dogs. My mother always had a dog. And uh, when uh, she uh, joined my father on board Calypso, uh, she spent more time on Calypso, always with a dog, uh, than my father, my brother, and myself together. And uh, she was playing a very critical role uh, to connect with the, uh, the crew because in those days, we were gone for three months, six months, and we had no connections with our families and friends. So. Uh, those people who had maybe problems or questions and so on, they always went to ask my mother. And she always had a dog. And unfortunately, these dogs live much shorter than we do. So she had to replace them from time to time. Uh, We're working on a transition now. Our older dog is 12 and the younger is six months. So it's, um, you know, Training up the next generation. That's what we do with children too, right? We train up the next generation. So you are hosting with the Ocean Future Society, an incredible adventure onto the ocean. So you can actually get tickets right now to join you for this 78 years of diving and discovery and join you on a whale watching tour on the surface. Not necessarily a scuba dive. I don't think a scuba dive is included, right? No, we're not scuba diving that day because I want to make sure anybody who's interested can come. And that people, uh, because of their age or their health or their uh, their age, uh, I mean, their beginning in life, and like babies and kids, uh, I want to make sure that uh, they can come and learn. And uh, so we're not diving. But uh, I miss it, of course, but I can share stories. And uh, that's only one of the big program that we have, which is part of the event that uh, the Ritz-Carlton Bacara here in California, in Los Angeles, in Santa Barbara, has put together. And uh, it's very emotional to me. So we have an evening on uh, the 10th for cocktails and whatnot. And then on the uh, on the 11th, Saturday, we have a presentation uh, uh, walking uh, into those mountains to make the connection with nature and the ocean. And then uh, I make a presentation that evening. We celebrate their dinner and so on. It's beautiful. I don't know if you've ever been to to uh, Bacara, but it's a very, very beautiful place. And then the next day we'll be on a boat and uh, spend uh, four and a half hours, I think, or more. I forgot the details. But we're going to be out there. And uh, it's not the season where the whales come, but it's a season. There may be some whales, but there'll be <laughs> dolphins and birds and all kinds of creatures uh, that uh, love to be at sea. And uh, so people, and I've done it many times, so we'll be there. And uh, the people are supporting it. Yeah, I think the humpback whales might be up here in Santa Cruz County off the coast gorging on sardines right now <laughs> because typically October is when they start to really hit our area. And I've even seen that their populations seem to be rebounding, going out on um, boat tours. I saw as many as, gosh, a, a pod of 100 Rizzo dolphins or so. So I know that every time you go out on sea, you you will see something and you will be like, it's just, it's just an amazing adventure. And so I personally am looking at whether or not I can make the time to come with my older son, who is going to be nine in January. And so in one year, he should be a diver. Yeah. So I'm, I'm looking at when we introduce scuba to him. And I think this could be like one of the first adventures for that. So I'm doing what I can with my schedule and my budget, because we will have just returned from a vacation where we're visiting Kona, well, the big island, with our, our children the month before. So my heart, like yours, I'm sure, goes out to everyone on Maui who has had to deal with the immense ravaging fires there. Oh, and you're going to the big island, but not to Maui. Not to Maui, no, not this year. Okay. 
because I was uh, there with Nan uh, and our team and uh, the local people and friends we have over there, thanks to Nan, because that's where we met. Uh, and uh, uh, the catastrophe is, is horrible what has happened there. And we're trying to help as much as we can. And uh, people can make donations specific for them through Ocean Futures. And 100% of it goes to help those people those people over there and we have a program on the Ritz Carlton back over there and uh, there were 630 people who used to work at that hotel that half of them have lost their homes uh, they lost their jobs and uh, we're trying to help as we can and anybody who's made uh, a donation uh, whether it's a hundred dollars or a thousand dollars whatever a hundred percent of it goes to those people so again, I will counsel all of my audience to just visit their website. It is simply oceanfutures.org. As always, we'll include links with show notes. But I'm going to see if I can make it to your event in Southern California, uh, well, kind of South Central California. So. You mean the 10, 11, and 12? Yeah, I'm hoping I can do it. I really um, see if I can align my schedule so, so that I can make it. It will probably mean leaving my younger son and my husband be ho- home behind us, though. Sadly. Well, maybe you can bring your son or maybe you can send your son. We'll take care of it. Yeah. Hey, that too. (laughs) Great. So as far as how our listeners can really support your network, what else would you advise them to do? And and I'm hoping some of them can join us here November 10th to 12th in Santa Barbara at the Ritz Carlton Baccarat. Again, I will include links to go directly to sign up for that on the website, but you can also just buy tickets directly from oceanfutures.org, buy tickets for the gala today, learn more, or just for the ocean adventure portion as well. So what other ways can you encourage people to get involved specifically with what you're doing? Well, I think it's fascinating, and it's not just me or Ocean Futures or my colleagues, to make sure every human being realize how connected we are to the ocean and how much we depend upon it, whether you live near it or far away from it. And uh, usually, I would say 90%, uh, if maybe more, of the people say, oh, I didn't know. Oh, I want to do that. Oh, I want to learn about this. Because it is fascinating. It's like adventure, uh, like discovery, just like I am when I go up on land and uh, listen to local people who are experts. And they can teach me and show me what to do and what not to do and what to take and what not take. Uh, and, and it's the same with the ocean. But we live on 30% of the planet, and we know a lot more about what's going on on the 30% than we know what's going in the ocean. So uh, the ocean is adventure, and it's endless. And uh, you, you can uh, be a diver, but you can snorkel, or you can uh, have someone who can transmit from underwater anywhere on the planet, which I did. I was in Fiji one day, and that was many years ago. It was in the 80s. I was underwater, and uh, I was able to speak and communicate to the Zodiac. uh, And the Zodiac had an antenna was going through via satellite. And people, at the same time, in Japan and in Canada, were asking me questions when I was underwater. And I was able to answer their questions right there. Uh, And it was either in English or in French, unfortunately. We went from Japan and speak Japanese, but uh, uh, they were speaking English very well. So it was exciting, and that's why the GONE, my project, which would require a few million dollars to make sure that happened, uh, and it's not for me, it's for the planet, uh, will allow people to anywhere on the planet ask questions to all those people wherever they are uh, nonstop. And that's where we, uh, one way or, or the other, uh, is going to happen. Yeah, I just, I love all of that. So you're essentially using underwater, like a full faced sort of helmet, so to speak, so you can actually use your voice and speak underwater. You can be in a piece of equipment, like the exosuit, where you're protected from the pressure, 
and you can breathe. And I'm certified now thanks to Phil Newton, who was the inventor of many, many of these equipment, uh, including submersibles and so on. Uh, and uh, I am certified to go down to a thousand feet in five minutes, spend two hours, and come back in five minutes. And there I can see things, or I can push the button and film or whatever. And uh, that's uh, where there are more and more thousands of people who are going to go. Mm. So what you're describing now is something you can do without worrying about getting the bends, which is something that can be debilitating for people who do deep dives. Now, I um, have also had the pleasure of touring Ambari's um, research facility, the Monterey Bay Aquarium Research Institute. They're taking underwater rovers into the trench just off the coast of Carmel, doing very deep work to discover new things every month, it seems. I wonder if you're connected to their work as well, and if you might have a word to say for anybody here on the Central Coast that wants to explore the underwater world. Well, I used to be connected because I've been there many times, and we used to uh, transmit uh, information from different parts of the ocean uh, to uh, to the uh, the aquarium. Uh, and uh, I think they're doing a great job, and they are now more and more concern about release species, how to protect them, what to do on the coastline, whether it's fishing or uh, ships coming and going or the pollution that is being released. There's a lot of very, very positive action, but we need to do a lot more and we need to uh, uh, be educated. And they are uh, experts over there that can help us do the much better job than I can do right now uh, because I haven't been there in quite a while. Yeah. Well, I would just encourage everyone here, if you happen to have the opportunity to be at or near the coast here in Santa Cruz or Santa Barbara, Monterey, to do what you can to explore the underwater and sea. And sometimes that is going to an aquarium like the Monterey Bay Aquarium and seeing what it looks like from the outside to inspire the curiosity that might take you into the water as well. I love that. Well, our mission at Ocean Futures is very simple, and it's for everyone. And it is, if you protect the ocean, you protect yourself. And I've been saying that now for many years, and I will never stop because that's what it's all about. Well, life comes from the sea. You know, we, we need to realize how, how reliant we are on the health of the ocean for the health of people, for the climate, and for the species that do things like make their way inland to leave their bodies in the forest, the trees go twice, twice as big where salmon spawn. I mean, these things are connected and they're related. So, you know, you want to yeah, sequester more breathe. carbon. Yes, exactly. What? More than half of the oxygen we breathe comes from algae species growing around the planet. Thanks to the whales. Thanks to the ocean. Thanks to evaporation. Thanks to what it does with the clouds. And the wind that brings them on top of a mountain, where people who have never seen the ocean, they are connected to the ocean. That's what the Ritz Carlton put together to let people know about uh, what we're doing on November 10, 11, 12. Well, there's even a handout. That's beautiful. So I see that too on your website. And again, that is simply oceanfutures.org. So very nice. We really appreciate. Thank you. It's Carlton, and thank you, Bacar. That's awesome, 100%. And that's why perhaps I will continue to live within a stone's throw of the shore. Thank you so much for joining me today, Jean-Michel. This has been my absolute pleasure, and I hope that I get to meet you on November 10th at the Ritz-Carlton Baccarat. I hope we can do that, and uh, uh, what you're doing and what needs to be done more and more and more is to have your son and his friends uh, connected to the ocean as much as we can. Yeah. Here, here to more of that. Absolutely. Again, thank you so much for joining me. As always, I will be sure to include links to where you can learn more about Jean-Michel Cousteau, the Ocean Future Society, and of course, the 78 Years of Diving and Discovery event on our dedicated blog page at caremorebebetter.com. As always, you can go directly to oceanfutures.org, perhaps consider doing a recurring donation, whether or not you're able to attend this event on the Central Coast of California. 
Santa Barbara at any rate. If you're listing after November 12th, if that's already in the past, don't fret. I'm sure there will be more opportunities to come. When you visit the show's website, caremorebebetter.com, you'll find complete transcripts to this episode, links and resources to past episodes that we touched on and other ways that you can get involved. And if you sign up for our newsletter too, you will be sure to receive our five-step guide to help organize your efforts and unleash your inner activist. Perhaps it's as simple as curating what the next generation understands about our natural world, contributing to them the way I hope to on the weekend of November 10th to 12th at the Ritz-Carlton. I mean, pull my leg. It's not going to be terrible to be there. I've never actually stayed at a Ritz-Carlton, so we'll see if I can swing that. Now, at the same time, I want to ask everyone here, if you enjoyed today's episode, please go ahead and subscribe on whatever platform you're listening and leave a comment or a like or a thumbs up, whatever the platform allows. All of those things ensure that this episode will reach more people and hopefully drum up those numbers on November 10th to 12th for Jean-Michel Cousteau and the Ocean Futures program. So thank you so much. Now, I just want to close with one simple thought. We can and will continue to protect our oceans together. We can and will build a brighter future together. This podcast is all about that. It's an invitation to care more so we can all create a better world. And sometimes that can be as simple as sharing this episode with people that you know in your community. Sometimes it can be as simple as reaching out to a society like the Ocean Futures Society and making a donation, or talking about it to a friend, or visiting the underwater world in some capacity, and inspiring your own curiosity to learn more so that you can have an impact in your neighborhood, in your community, and the people around you by sharing your knowledge. That's everything that Jean-Michel Cousteau has dedicated his life to, and I have to say I'm in deep admiration for it. My only hope is that we can all amplify that together. Thank you, now and always, for being a part of this pod and this community because together we can do so much more. We can care more, we can be better, we can even create that bluer ocean and brighter world together. Thank you. Thanks for listening to Care More, Be Better, a podcast for social good. To make sure you never miss an episode, subscribe, rate, and review wherever you listen to podcasts. And share with your friends to help us reach more people and spread more social good. 